And uh, did you know that Jesus' name is really kind of uh, the same? Joshua. Yeshua. Like he's wearing a Joshua shirt, a Yeshua shirt. You know, that Jesus isn't even, you know, a name in Hebrew. They just translated that over into English. It's just a word that they made up, you know, but it's Yeshua. Yeshua. Uh, so <clears throat> I just want to kind of re reach and hit on that. And, and I think part of the reason why is because, you know, the enemy does not want you to know who you are. The enemy is shaking in his boots right now. He does not want you here. And the people that are watching online, he does not want you paying attention. He wants you getting distracted with your kid or whatever it is you're doing. But I believe that if you will connect this morning, you're going to see something in a way that you haven't seen it before. It's going to unlock things. Things you already know, you're going to have greater light on. Amen? It's like a, a fine diamond. Every time you turn it, you see another facet. And you're enamored by the beauty of it and the brilliance of it. That's what I believe that, that you're going to see this morning. Um, but see, the enemy, he, he doesn't want you to think that you're enough, first of all. Because of your past. Or he doesn't want you to think that you measure up. You're not good enough. Not going to do it. You, you messed up too much. Um, and, and I got some things last week in prayer that I was going over. And I wanted to kind of... Uh, bring them into today, if that's okay. Can we do that? Because you know, prayer changes things. Does it not? There's an anointing on prayer from the Holy Ghost that you can get verse, you know, better than any pet talk or motivational speech or anything. And so I want to share a little bit with you uh, this morning <clears throat> as uh, I receive it. Amen? Amen. Amen. So last week in prayer, uh, Pastor Dana and I, we were, we were praying and, and I recorded it, but I also took notes on it too, um, because I value that time that we have together. Uh, and I value that time that, that when we pray together um, in the Holy Spirit. And last week in prayer, we came against and cut off a, the spirit of lies and discouragement. Yeah. So you know what that tells me? People will be lied to. Uh, come on. Devil's been lying to you all week. As a matter of fact, he's been lying to you since the day you were born. Uh, true. How do I know that? He has no truth in him. Right. Father of lies, there is no truth. He couldn't tell you the truth if it would put him back into heaven. Uh, Still couldn't do it. That's right. that's because he can't tell the truth. But what we did, here's the great thing about knowing your identity and knowing who you are in Christ, knowing how to operate in that and use the name of Jesus and the blood of Jesus. What we did, we cut it off. We cut off those spirit lies. And I heard yesterday already of just some little bitty testimonies, some pretty cool ones, of lies being exposed. I was like, we prayed that a week ago. Isn't that like the Holy Ghost to get out in front of it? What was so cool about it? We didn't have to have fight our battles. We didn't have to do nothing. I was like, this is cool. I kind of like this. You know? But here's the thing. That was one part of it, but here's the discouragement. There's a spirit of discouragement that will try to get you to stay in your place. Wants to keep you in your seat. Because you know you're not a threat when you're in your seat. When you rise up, that's when you become a threat to the enemy. Yes. Remember last week we were reading the scripture because those that sit in darkness, you can't move when you don't have any light. But when you have light, you can stand up and start to do something. Well, discouragement will keep you in darkness. Yeah. And discouragement will keep you from moving forward. So we also cut that off. Yes. And you know what the key was? Here it is. Three words. Just do it. That's what we prayed out. We just do it. We just do it. We just do it. We just do it. I mean, we just kept saying it over and over. And then my wife says, don't get in your head. I'm going to go, all the men. Don't get in your head. It's easier for us to get in our head. 
Because we want to figure it all out. I, I mean, I had a conversation with a, a close friend of mine this week, and I said, man, you can't live up here. You can't live up there. Because you'll lose every time. But when you live out of your spirit, you live out of your spirit, oh man, it's a new day. Come on. I mean, you're like, whoa, nothing is impossible. Right? You feel like, it. have you ever seen the movie Elf? He's like, I'm in love, I'm in love, and I don't care who knows about it. Like that's how you feel when you live from your spirit. You do not care. I can't believe I just did that. But it's okay. I didn't get in my head. It must have worked. Didn't get in my head. What's your pastor talking about? Uh, Elf? What? It's March. Yeah, I know. He's like that. It's okay. It's anointed. Here's what's so cool about this. God knew what was going to happen today, and he knew tomorrow was the start of double joy, so we get the head start. We're preparing. We're getting ready to. We have some joy today, but guess what? Tomorrow, you should expect double. Expect double. I mean, double for your trouble. If you've been dealing with lies or discouragement, guess what? You get double. It's in the word. It's in the word. And as I was praying, um, we have this cool backyard where it has like a big field behind us. And, and so I have to sit up there and kind of just read sometimes. And so I got this book, and I highly recommend you get it if you don't have it. <clears throat> it's called Experiencing the Depths of God by uh, Madame Guillaume. Is that what you say? You say that right? Yeah. Okay, thank you. Um, and I mean, like, I sent my wife a picture of my back of... <laughs> A highlighted page with a bunch of cry emojis all around it because, man, when you read that and find out how much he loves you and how much he wants to spend time with you, oh my gosh. You get so full of this joy and this peace that literally, Elf has nothing on you. You're in love, you're in love, and you don't care who knows about it. And so, I found this part that I had to share with you. And we know that Jesus came and we could have a relationship with him. But a lot of times we think of the word relationship and, you know, we think, hey, buddy, hey, acquaintance, hey, friend. And we even think that sometimes the, the time um, equates to a deeper type of friendship, right? Or almost like age equates to a maturity. Did you know you could be 80 years old and still immature as anything? Yeah. Yeah. Still living in high school? Yeah. Right? I, got, I got some yeah. spirit connections. I got some friends that just would connect with the spirit. Like, I could see him and like, hey, what's up, man? Boo! And we just connect like we haven't even missed a beat. You know, there's a, I mean, oh, there's Joe. There's your right there. Hey, you're right. How you doing, man? <laughs> 1995 right there. It's a spirit connection right there. That guy. Awesome. We used to hang out together and talk when things we went to the Bible school together. It was connected. There's just something about that that you connect to. Um, <clears throat> and when we think of relationships, we think, oh, acquaintances, friends, whatever. But when Jesus says he wants you to have a relationship with him, he's literally talking intimacy. Yeah. Uh -huh. Like the, 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 the law first mentioned, when the word intimacy is talking about that, it literally is referring to like an inter, you know, Course, right? It's like deep intimacy. And here's what she says in this book. When you come to know Christ, it's magnetic. It is magnetic. You're drawn to him. And here's the thing. You're not just drawn to him in one area. You're drawn to him in every way shape, and fashion. Yes. You can't get enough of them in your life. Yes. And he draws you more and more to himself. Mm -hmm. 
And as he's drawing you closer and closer to himself, you begin to, to purify things in you. Things just happen. And the example that was given, I loved it. <clears throat> she made the mention of the ocean. In the ocean, there's the waves rolling and things happening. And so what happens is water begins to evaporate in the ocean. And as that vapor goes up into the clouds, it moves towards the sun. As that vapor leaves the earth, it's full of impurities. But as it gets higher and higher, those impurities are burned out from the heat of the sun. And as it gets higher and higher and drawn into the heavens, uh, not only uh, does it remain uh, passive in, in, in coming up, it becomes completely pure. And then, then the gravity of the earth draws that pure water back down. And the only difference between that vapor and us is we have a choice. We actually can draw on God. We can draw on Him and draw on His presence and in that relationship by choice. And we, that, how we draw Him is by faith. And so the closer we get to Him, the more those impurities are burned out. The more those fears are burned out and the more those old traditions are burned out. And the more in love we fall with Jesus, in with Jesus, we fall into love with him more and more. And we become more fashioned and more transformed and more changed into his image. And it's just a draw, he's wooing you in and, and drawing you in closer and closer. And you're like, well, how do I do that? You don't even have to do it. That's what's so cool about it. Check this out, Ephesians 2. I want you to see this. Ephesians 2. It says this, for it is by grace you've been saved through faith. It's not of yourselves. Your works didn't do it. Your praying in the Holy Ghost for four hours a day didn't do it. Your reading the Bible uh, every morning didn't do it. It's a gift of God is what it says. For by grace you were saved through faith. Not of yourselves, but of God. And it's not of works, lest you should boast. We're not the ones that boast about it. We can't. Here it is. This is the part. We are his workmanship. You're his masterpiece. He, that's why you're so drawn to him. He created you. He designed you. He, he made you like a best spoke suit. Do you know what a best spoke suit is? Custom tailor made basically stand like this and they put pads and arms and like okay the shoulders dropped a little further. What side do you wear your watch on? Okay, we're gonna make the cuff on this side a little bit bigger and this leg's a little longer. I mean it's like custom made to you. And God says you are his best spoke suit. You are his masterpiece. David has nothing on you. Right. Right? We're created a masterpiece in who? In who? What does it say? Christ Jesus. The anointing. The anointed one and his anointing. Right? That's where you made a masterpiece. It's in the anointing. That's how those impurities get pulled out. You see that? You see how that's working? You see how it happens there? For good works which God has prepared beforehand. I had lunch this week with some pretty um, successful men. Um, we're all about the same. They're a little bit younger than me, but they're much. They're very successful financially. And one of them uh, was a, a family member of one of the guys. And it was kind of a <clears throat> divine appointment. Well, he's a cessationalist. Do you know what that is? A cessationalist is one that believes that all the miracles, signs, and wonders, and all those things ended with the apostles, with the disciples. That's what a cessationalist is. Miracles, no more. Tongues, no more. Signs and wonders, no more. And what's so cool with the divine appointment is I'm sitting next to my friend who um, God just worked through me to get him filled with the Holy Spirit and just revolutionized. His life was awesomely transformed because of that. And then his friend was across right in front of me. And his life gets transformed just two years ago. And this guy over here uh, is a missionary from Brazil that has um, one of the fastest growing churches in Pakistan. 
a Muslim nation, the third largest Muslim nation in the world, and they're reaching people for Jesus hand over fist. And then there's a sensationalist right beside it. And we're just talking, hey, when I was in Nepal, here's the miracle that I experienced. And this guy said, oh, yes, and the Lord did this and this miracle and, and this wish. And he was, he was a witch, uh, witchcraft. When he was a teenager, he, he practiced a lot of witchcraft because he wanted the power. And then he found out about this other power from Jesus and decided to take that instead. And now he started preaching two weeks later in his high school. And now he's doing crusades uh, to 10 to 50,000 people a day. He lives here in Brooklyn Air. It's pretty awesome. Yes. So the sensationalists are sitting here, and, and, and the, the Brazilian guy, you know, he has that Portuguese accent. He looks over and he goes, Do you, so do you, do you believe these things? And he's like, No. <laughs> no. Like, kind of cocky. He goes, <laughs> Okay. <laughs> Just like, You're lost. And so my, my friend ended up talking with the guy for quite some time to try to reach him. And the thing is, is we get our eyes blinded. We're so caught up in, well, this is what the Lord's going to do, and it's got to do it this way. And I have to be in apologetics. I have to know everything possibly that I can possibly know. No, you just need to know that I am in him, Christ Jesus. I'm his masterpiece, and I am a work in progress. I mean, I am a piece of clay right now. Like, I got my leg going. That's about it right now. There's still some things working. And that's how you have to approach it. But see, he couldn't deny. He said not one word the entire time. Because we're talking miracle after miracle after miracle after miracle. He couldn't say a word. And by the way, God opened up a door. Uh, you all are going to be beneficiaries of this. Because of the, the guy that invited me there... He goes, hey, I just feel led right now that if anybody wants to go on this crusade in, in July, um, I'll pay for it. And I told him why. She goes, well, then what do you think? I said, well, I'm going to pray about it. And like, yep, I'm going. He goes, done. Boom. So July 7th, I'll be uh, in Brazil uh, preaching to 50,000 people. And people are going to get saved. People are going to get healed. People are going to hope. Like, here's what we do. We're going to provide food for the poor people. And then we're going to go knocking on doors and seeing who needs healing. Amen. And then that night we're going to preach to anywhere from 10 to 50,000 people. And we're going to do that every night for a week. And you will be beneficiaries of that because you're part of the counter church. So when you're in heaven and some Portuguese person goes, Todo bem, which means it's, what's up, how you doing? You say, oh, how are you? And they're going to say, thank you. For what? For allowing your pastor to come and preach the gospel so I can receive Jesus. See, you're God's masterpiece. You're God to make no junk. And that's why it's so important in this era, this is where I'm trying to get to, is that we are called to be strong and courageous. Not sissies and weak, quiet people. Come on. See, the first phrase as a Christian is, okay, what has God done for me? He saved me. He healed me. Uh, rescued me. Restored me. Redeemed me. All those things. And then you start to get that and understanding who you are in Christ. Then the next part of a believer is, okay, now what can I do for God? What can you do for Him? How can we begin to fulfill those things that He's purposed in our lives? That's easy. Believe big. Anybody believe it for some big things? Yeah. I, I did my vision board last year and I had some big things on there. Like, yeah, and I'm still believing for them. In fact, I got I added things on my mirror. But here's what I did is on the mirror, they're the smaller portions. Believe big. Start small. And I don't know if I liked it. I didn't like it when I first heard it. I was like, that does not bear witness with my soul. I'm a spirit, my soul. Mine didn't like it. But if you look at everything Jesus did, it started with the seed. Yeah. Everything starts with the seed. Yeah. Everything starts with the fact. I'm, I'm going to show you something. We're just going to jump around a little bit. You cool with that? Yeah. 
Before we get to the C part, I want you to see this in Zechariah. You can write this down, Zechariah 4.10. And this is the New Living Translation. It says, don't despise small beginnings, for the Lord rejoices to see the work begin and see the plumb line in Zerubbabel's hand. The seven lamps represent the eyes of the Lord that search all around the world. See, he's searching for someone to start something. Do you, are you ready to start something? Do you want to be stuck in something? Get high, get off of Get up, get up now. Stuck in the middle. We're not stuck in the middle, guys. We're getting over. I'm not a vegetable either. We're getting over. Say, I'm getting over. See, in, in, in Ecclesiastes, another scripture, it says anybody can start something, but it's who finishes. God rejoices. It says the Lord rejoices to see the work begin. Can you imagine what he does when he finishes? We're starting something. So, so turn with me real quick. Matthew in there, Gracie? Is that a yes or a no? Yes. Put it up there. Put it. Oh, there it is. All right. Thank you. This is Matthew, uh, and this is verses, uh, I'm going to read a lot of verses here. Jesus said to his disciples, why do you use parables when you talk to people? He replied, you're better to understand the secrets of the kingdom of heaven. He's trying to give us keys. Don't you like it when you get keys? Yes. You don't have to pick the lock. He's giving you the keys. We went and did an escape room Friday night, and we were like, we're sitting in the room, and we were like overthinking everything. <laughs> we're like, like we, I was in the room with Esther, actually, and, one, and this, the first room we were in, we were sitting around, and we're like, okay. And there's these trays, and we flip the trays over, and it said, Scotch bonnet, chili, pimento, and what was the other one? Habanero. Like, we have, and we're like, peppers, peppers. Is there a pimento pepper? I don't know. Is there a Scotch bonnet? I mean, we were like overthinking everything. But I opened up the salt shaker, opened it up, and peeled it out. And there's four dashes, and two of the dashes were filled with peppers. And they told us going in, hey, you're going to have half of the clue, and the other room's going to have the other half of the clue. And we just kept thinking, okay, is there something else? And we started taking apart everything, like fake bread. We were looking at it, was there anything on it? And then we took up these things, and we went, oh, there's Morse code. Like, How is this? How do we figure this out? And we are like, just overthinking everything. But I was like, we got the key right here. We got the half, they got the other half. Let's go find them. And finally they got their thing and we got together and beep, boop, 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 four digits, bleep, 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 door was open. It was awesome. But then it was extremely frustrating because we tried those codes on every other door. <laughs> we were like, hey, what was that number? 5387, 5387, 5387. And they were, everybody was just pushing numbers. And then the, and the kids were pushing the numbers. And, and there were so many numbers pushed. We were like, don't let the kids touch these two doors because they're froze up. Right? Do we not? Do we not? It was fun. But see, Jesus is trying to give us keys that we don't have to figure out. We don't have to get an escape room and see if we survive in Antarctica. He's given us the key. He goes, you're permitted to understand the secrets or keys of the kingdom of heaven, but others are not. To those who listen to my teaching... More understanding will be given to you, and they will have an abundance of knowledge. But for those who are not listening, that means you're in the room, you're not paying attention. Even what little understanding they do have will be taken away from them. Well, that doesn't seem fair. Well, they're not honoring it. It's pretty easy. This is why I use parables. For they look, but they don't really see. He's referencing the Old Testament, by the way. They hear, but don't really listen or understand. This fulfills the prophecy of Isaiah that says, when you hear what I say, you will not understand. When you see what I do, you will not comprehend. For the hearts of these people are hardened, and their ears cannot hear, and they have closed their eyes, for their eyes cannot see, and their ears cannot hear, and their hearts cannot understand, and they cannot turn to me and let me heal them. Do you know we pray?
running this like every week. Eyes open, ears open, and hearts open. Over and over. Why do we pray that? Because Jesus himself and the prophet Isaiah are saying, hey, they're hearing, but they can't hear. They're looking, but they can't see. Their hearts can't understand. So, but blessed, if I say blessed, blessed, blessed are your eyes because they see in your ears because they hear. Blessed means empowered to prosper or advance. You get to unlock more doors. I tell you the truth, many prophets and righteous people long to see what you see. That right there. Selah. But they didn't see it. And they longed to hear what you hear, but they didn't hear it. Now listen to the explanation of the parable about the farmer planting seeds. Listen to this. This is how important seeds are. Jesus himself is talking about this. The seed that fell on the footpath represents those who hear the message about the kingdom and don't understand it. Then the evil one comes and snatches away the seed that was planted in their hearts. The seed on the rocky soil represents those who hear the message and immediately receive it with joy. But since they don't have the deep roots, they don't last long. They fall away as soon as they have problems or are persecuted for believing God's word. That was me for a while. Man, I don't know what to do about this Jesus thing. I'm getting too much pressure. Right? But then you grow up a little bit. You realize, oh, okay, hold on. It's part of it. If I hang on, I'm going to make it. The seed that fell among the thorns represents those who hear God's word, but all too quickly the message is crowded out by the worries of his life and Lord wealth, and no fruit is produced. The seed that fell on the good soil represents those who truly hear and understand God's word and produce a harvest of 30, 60, or even 100 times as much as we planted. That's one of the um, times we're talking about 30, 60, 100. All the other times we reference 160, 30, by the way. And the other times come from a tax man in a position. So, Here's another story Jesus said, the kingdom of heaven is like a farmer who planted a good seed, there it is again, in his field. But that night the workers slept and the enemy came and planted weeds among the wheat and they slipped away. And when the crop began to grow, it produced grain and weeds also grew. The farmer's workers sent him and said, sir, the field where you planted is good seed is full of weeds. Where do they come from? And the enemy has done this. The farmer explained, should we pull out the weeds, they asked. No. You'll uproot the weed if you do. Let both grow together until the harvest. We just talked about that earlier. Then I will tell the harvesters to sort out the weeds to them into bundles and burn them and put the wheat in the barn. Now, I want you to notice something. You can look this up for yourself. Eight times. Jesus mentions the word seed in those 20 verses. Eight times he says that. Do you think he's trying to get something across to us? Yeah. Believe big, start small. Starts with the seed. Eight times. Eight represents new beginnings. You need some new pathways in your thought process. You need some new patterns in your life. It all starts with the seed. It all starts with something small. And as you do that, you'll start seeing radical change in your life. Yeah. Yeah. Right? Yeah. Okay, good. So let them cut it on me. Now check this out. We, we look at things in the natural. Remember we prayed, get out of your head. Get out of your head. Get out of your head. And we look at things in the natural. What am I going to do about this? What? I mean, I've got challenges this week. I had to go back to my notes and then what we were praying about. I'm like, okay. I'm not going to get in my head. I'm going to stay over in the spirit, you know. And here's why. We know this very, you don't even have to look it up, but it's 1 Samuel 6, 7. It says, the Lord doesn't see as man sees. For the Lord looks at the heart, right? right. But the man looks at the outward. Right. Man looks at the outward appearance, the Lord looks at the heart. So here's what we do. We start by submitting ourselves to God. You can't even, you know it says, resist the devil, don't flee from me. We try to resist them all the time without submitting. You can't resist the devil unless you submit to God first. You got to submit to something in your life. Right? That's why God set things up the way he did. Now, when I was praying yesterday, I got, you know, 
I go over to this place, I didn't get to pray with my wife uh, yesterday because she was out partying. No, I'm just kidding. <laughs> <laughs> they were having women's encounter. It was awesome, by the way. And they had a great time. It was really cool. But yesterday I was praying and I kept getting up choice driven, choice driven. Everything in life is choice driven. And here's what I wrote down. You have a choice to rejoice or be critical. You have a choice to honor or be offended. You have a choice to receive or reject. Well, I don't know if I like what he's saying. Well, receive it or reject it. It's your choice. Doesn't matter to me either way. But then now Joshua, remember the Lord told him, and Joshua told the people, you choose today which you will serve. You know what serve means? Allow that to be your master. Are you going to allow offense to be your master? Or honor? Are you going to allow rejection to be your master? Or rejoicing? Are you going to allow a critical spirit to be your master? Or rejoicing? It's going to be, right? Now, this is what I want to get to, and we're going to close it up with this. Joshua 1, I'm going to read nine verses. We're going to allow the word today. <clears throat> Listen to this. After the death of Moses, the Lord's servant, the Lord spoke to Joshua, the son of Nun, Moses' assistant. He said, Moses, my servant, is dead. Therefore, the time has come for you to lead the people, the Israelites, across the Jordan River into the land I am giving them. He not given it to him yet, has he? According to the way it says here. But, because I promise you what I promised Moses. Whenever you set foot, you will be on the land I've given you. See, past tense. Already, I'm going to give it to them, but I've already given it to you. You've got to lead the way. Okay? From the Negev wilderness to the south of Lebanon mountains and the north of the Euphrates River and the east of the Mediterranean Sea and the west, including all the land of the Hittites, no one will be able to stand against you for as long as you live. For I will be with you as I was with Moses. I will not fail you or abandon you. If that wasn't encouragement enough, I don't know what is. But God's so cool that he says this in the very next verse. Be strong and courageous. I mean, we can preach this backwards, sideways, upside down. We've heard it forever. But I want you to hear something. Be strong and courageous, for you are the ones who will lead these people and possess all the land I swore to their ancestors that I would give them. Past tense. See, look, look at past, present, and future. All right there. He goes, be strong and very courageous. First, he tells us to be strong and courageous. Then he tells us to be very courageous. Be careful to obey all the instructions Moses gave. Do not deviate from them, turning either to the right or to the left. And then you will be successful in everything you do. Right. Everything. That, that's our instruction. Read this daily and you will be successful in everything. Don't deviate from it. Well, I don't really believe it says that. Okay. You're not going to be successful. I don't really believe in those miracles. Okay, well, stay broke. I don't believe in those signs. Well, okay, stay uh, sick. Yeah. Right? You guys remember the story when uh, the guy that I got to pray for, the guy I had lunch with this week, his brother, um, he told his brother, his brother's like, what? He comes over, uh, we sit down to talk. His brother has um, Bell's palsy and the suicide disease. He had so much pain that he was taking all these pills every two and a half hours and his own wife couldn't even touch his face because of the nerve endings were so, they called it the suicide disease. We talked for four hours, he didn't take one pill. And I asked him a very significant question. I go, hey, do you believe that God heals? He goes, yeah. I go, but do you believe that he'll heal you? Stupid question, but do you believe that he would heal you? He goes, well, sure. And I go, okay. Do you want to be healed? Right. That's it. And he goes, well, I've never, yeah. I said, okay. 
We prayed, boom. He got healed instantly. Has never taken another pill since. No pain. No pain. He did a video. He goes down the street to Battle Creek. Was it? Yeah, Battle Creek. He goes down there. Um, great guy. Loves the Lord. Super happy. In fact, they did a video and showed the whole thing. It was awesome. But that was the thing is he had to choose. You have to choose. It wasn't anything that I did. It was God. But he had to make the choice. Right? So this causes success in your life. However, listen to this. I want to, this is the part I want to get to. He says, study this book of instruction continually. Now, give me grace on this. It doesn't say watch Dutch sheets every morning. It said give me grace before I said it. Now, I watch Dutch sheets all the time. I get a lot of good stuff from it. But that doesn't say that that's going to give me good success. i got to read this for myself. Now, he gives me so many nuggets that it leads me to this. You know, Paga and all these awesome Hebrew words. I mean, amazing. But YouTube is not going to cause me to prosper. It's not going to heal me. You know, it, there, it's a great venue or avenue in, in which to get there. But this, it says the word. Study this book of instruction continually. Yes. Is it up there? Yes. Study this book of instruction continually. Medicate on a day and night. No, I said that on purpose. Yeah. Yeah. Medicate on this day and night. Just like that guy who was taking a pill, he had to take a pill every two and a half hours to manage the pain to where he could somewhat function. I, read, I said that on purpose. Medicate on the word day and night. If, if, if uh, my wife and I, like we, when we get prescriptions, it says take three a day. Sometimes people only take one a day and wonder why it isn't working. Let me come over here. I'm not seeing anybody in particular, but if you don't follow the prescription, you can't expect to receive the, the, the prescribed amount for your, not even healing, but just Recovery. Yes. This says meditate or medicate on it day and night and be sure to obey everything that's written in it. And if you medicate on it, uh, you might get some quick results. But if you medicate on it daily, the long-term effects yes. will far away what the instantaneous results are. It may take you some time, but if you'll stay in that word, day and night, night and day, let it sit our eyes, no, But literally, if you'll pray and you'll get in the word, day and night, night and day, you'll start to see a difference, a significant difference. Amen? Amen. And when you medicate, it says this, only then. Does it say that? Does it say maybe then? Sometimes then? Only then. You know what only means in the Hebrew? Only. Only then will you prosper and succeed in all you do. And I, mine is, if you look at mine here, mine is green and in bold letters. Only then will you succeed in all you do. This is my command. Be strong and courageous. That's three times it's telling us, be strong and courageous. What does that tell us? Joshua was facing opportunities. And, and you know God knows you, right? And he knows you better than you know yourself. And so Joshua, he been like, well, you know, uh, when, uh, uh, God, I feel, I feel like I am being strong. He wouldn't say that to God. No, he, he's not being strong. That's why God had to tell him. He was being weak. And he was being scared. That's why the Lord came to him and said, be strong and courageous. 
Now, in the Hebrew, the word strong, there's so many mentions of it, but the specific mention of this in here is, is significant. I'm going to get there. But, you know, he tells him basically strong and courageous four times. And we know what four means. It's a door. Four is the letter delet in Hebrew. Four is the door. So he's saying, if you'll be strong and courageous, I'll open doors for you that you could never open on your own. Okay. Yes, yeah. Never saw that before. And Joshua's thinking, well, I've seen Moses and I've seen how the people are. Of course he was needing some strength and some courage. But see, God's saying, hey, if you'll obey what doesn't make sense and trust God's word, trust his word, then God will perform that word and open doors into you you'll never get on your own. Now check this out. The word strong in this context is be firm and, con and confident in God's strength. Not yours. Not, hey, load, load 600 on the, the bench. Uh, no, you're going to tear some things. Or we die. <laughs> He's like, no, be strong, be firm and confident in God's strength. And here's where the courage, the courage is an imperative word that says be bold always. Courageous means to be bold always. In today's culture, when they're allowing drag queens to read pornographic books to little kids in libraries, you got to be bold. Yeah. You gotta stand up for righteousness. Yes. I'm not trying to go weird on you, but in this era, Joshua was in an era where he had to lead. We're in an era where we need to lead. Yes. And we need to be bold yes. and courageous. Yes. We need to be fixed firm on God's strength yes. and confident in his strength and bold always. Yes. It's imperative to be bold always. If you want good success, only then. Remember, only then is if you're strong and courageous. Firm and confident in God's strength and imperatively be bold and courageous. Always. Be bold always. And then you'll have good success. That's what God's asking you of us in this time and era. Because here's the thing. God gives his word and his word is never lacking power. Is it? Never. I'm closing. I'm closing. That's two times. I got one more. So when Joshua received a word, I'd love to just get into the, the movie scene of this. Joshua, he's in the media presence, the tabernacle. He's sitting in there like Moses is sitting there. He's sitting in there and there's a cloud. He's worshiping and he hears the voice of the Lord. And he says, Hey, Moses, my servant, he did. So you, wherever you go, just like I was with him, I'm going to be with you. Now, wherever you go is where I'm leading you. And every place you put your foot, I'm giving it to you. Not only am I giving it to you, I'm telling you, be confident in my strength and be bold always. It's imperative that you're bold. Always. And then, I promise you, you'll have good success. So you, you, you see this picture, right? That's He's in that tent. He's hearing all this stuff. And he's like, whoa. What? Wow. So he's hearing that. That's the same thing as us opening up this. The word says, boom, 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 boom. I'm reading it. It's just like God talking to me. This is God talking to me. This is God talking to you. Very same thing. You're thinking, oh man, how cool would it be uh, to be like Joshua or be like Moses? And then there's this cloud in the day and, and there's this mist and they're seeing face to face. And, and you, get, you get to see him every day. You don't even got to wait to go into a tent. You just open the Bible and start talking to you. Right? 
Now, now Hebrews 4 it says that the word of God is powerful, more powerful, uh, than, and more, it's sharper than any two-edged sword, than any scalpel, than the exacto knife, than any samurai blade. It's able to divide asunder between the soul, mind, will, and emotions, and the spirit. Right? So it's able to do these things, but what happens is in the churches, our soul, our mind, will, and emotions is leaping the way everywhere. And we're not allowing our spirit to be separated from our soul. And we're speaking all of this stuff from a soulish place. And the enemy has strategically done that because he wants you to be an echo. Echo. Right? You know why he wants you to be an echo? Because your voice matters. You have a unique DNA in your voice. You have a unique sound. Joshua had a unique sound. He had a unique voice. And he had to go and speak what the Lord told him to go and lead the people. Now you may not be leading millions of people, but you may be leading your own life. And when the word comes to you, you've got to speak what the word says over what your soul is trying to tell you. And your soul is trying to tell you, well, you just need to be really wise about this. And you just don't need to get out there. Don't get too crazy. No, you need to step out and declare it's already won. It's already won. You've already got it. So, so it, it, there's, there's a voice that you have that no one else has. Did you know that? Like they try to, you know, you watch the sci-fi movies, the Mission Impossible movies, and the people put a little thing over there and they sound like they're messing over there. They have technology for that or whatever, and it can sound really close, but you're, if you look at your voice, it's got a certain blueprint, a certain DNA, a certain type of fingerprint that nobody else has. So that's why you have to speak to your mountain. You have to talk to it. Joshua had to lead them in. He had to be strong and courageous. You know, he's like, okay, I'm not who I used to be. Now, we forget so easily that Joshua was a slave. That's all he knew. He wasn't 400 years old. We know that. So he had been born a slave and raised as a slave, but there's something inside of him that caused him not to think like a slave. There was a desire in him for a greater. There was a desire in him to get into the presence of God. And if you remember, when they chose the twelve, he was one of them. And he was one of the only ones who was Caleb that came back with a good report. See, he spoke to his mountain. Then what happened to Caleb? Eighty years old. Hey, I'm willing. Give me my mountain. You gotta speak to your mountain. It's voice activated. I'm telling you that we're in this time and this era to be strong, be courageous, but speak to those things. There's people that, that I've heard things that are kind of disheartening to me because uh, it's the word. And the word says this, speak to your mountain. You have to speak to it. That's not weird. And if anybody wants to put me on the name and claim it list, so be it. Because that's what God said, and it was so. Take it up with Him. Okay? Now, yes, you can do it for greedy gain and all of that filthy lucre and all that stuff. We're not part of that. We're not part of that. But we are this. Hey, uh, if my body's telling me one thing, and the doctor's telling me the same thing that my body's telling me, but the Word says different, I'm going to go with what the Word says. And I'm only going to speak what the word says. Right. So when somebody goes, hey, what the doctor say? Oh, nothing really. But I'll tell you what, I'm healed of the Lord. Yes. I'm blessed coming in and blessed going out. Yes. You know, I, I'm from the top of my head to the soles of my feet, I'm covered in the blood of Jesus. Yes. You've got to start speaking, but it takes boldness and it takes courage. Yes. Your boldness or your strength comes from God. It's his strength. It's not yours. 
Is that increasing yours like we talked about last week? I don't need four arms. I don't need to be in Mortal Kombat. Right? I just need what I do have to be stronger. And when God's anointing comes upon you, just like it came upon Gideon, just like it came upon David, just like it came upon Samson, just like it came upon the boy with the two uh, the fishes and the loaves and gave it to Jesus. It starts small, but it ends up being great. How does that happen? Strong and courageous. Amen? Be strong and courageous. What I love about this is that, you know, Joshua was a slave, but he wasn't, uh, he may have been a slave, but he wasn't living like a slave. If I can say that rightly. He, he was a slave, but that's not where he was any longer. Like, I'm not where I used to be. You need to remind yourself of that. You're yes. not who you used to be. Yes. You're not where you used to be. You don't think like you used to think. Even last week, you don't think like that. It's old. It's over. It's over. See, we're no longer on the defensive. We're on the offensive. The enemy wants to keep you sitting down. He wants to keep you back. He doesn't want you doing anything. But you've got to start speaking to some things. That's why, like, I, I was telling Dana last night, I was like, hey, we need to pray. Like, I was not upset about it. I was kind of hurt. <laughs> not really, but yes. I missed it. I miss it. It's uncomfortable, but I miss it. You know what I mean? It's like going to the gym to do legs. It's like, I know I need to, but I don't really want to go. But then when I start doing it, like, this is awesome. Right? You don't want to stop. And if you ever pray with Pastor Dana, she don't want to stop. It's awesome. I'm like, okay, 45 minutes in, she's getting warmed up. Where we go? <laughs> go to the bathroom before you start praying. Right? But here's why. Here's why I love this. When you get into the flow of God, you don't ever want to get out. You don't ever want to leave. It's awesome. That's why I love, like, you know, the clock getting up here. Come on, let's go. I'm like, everybody, go to the lay hands on everybody. <laughs> Give him some of that. He stepped through something. He got into a flow. You know, I stepped into a flow. Dominique stepped into a flow. Amber stepped into a flow. Esther, I saw her stepping into a flow. Everybody stepping into a flow. Yes. Like, everything around me saying one thing, but I, I don't care. Yes. I'm in love, I'm in love, and I don't care who knows about it. Right? That's how you have to be. That's strong and courageous. See, I'm literally going to close right now with this. In fact, turn the lights down. Please. That'll really make me close. Speaking of Dutch sheets, there's a word called testimony. And I don't remember the Hebrew word of it. Do you remember? Does, does anybody hear? I mean, I got Pagas stuck in my head. I know it's not it. It's not it at all. It might be Debar. It might be like DeBarge, you know, it is DeBarge, man, I'm pretty good, thank you, Holy Spirit, it wasn't me, I'm not that good, it was the Holy Spirit, bring it to my remembrance, but it's DeBar. and uh, I don't have a, a rod, so I use a drumstick, everywhere they went, they had a stick, and it was kind of helping them walk, but on the stick, it told a story, and on the story, like this one says, uh, Los Angeles, 5A, Bader, that's the kind of stick this is. So, it tells a story, the quality, the brain. But these people, David, carried a staff. Remember, Goliath says, you come in with the staff and the spear, right? I'm a feature of the dogs. <laughs> and you know, you know, what did he say? I come to you in the name of the Lord. But see, on the staff, they would put these markings of significant or epochal moments and they would card into something significant that God had done in their life and it was a marker to remind them. Yes. And he had a bear and he had a lion. And he, every time he saw it, he was reminded. Every time he took that step, he sees that bear. Oh, the Lord delivered that lion. The Lord delivered that bear into my hands. Everywhere he's going and he's sitting down there and he's watching all the sheep doing their grace thing and he's playing on his little uh, Takamimi guitar. He's like, and he's like, you know, 
bless the Lord of my soul, and all, all the good stuff that he's singing, you know, Psalms 23 and all that stuff. Psalms 30 and all that. He's going through all that, and he's thinking of the goodness of God and how he brought him out of this other. And so when he gets there to Goliath, I love this, he starts to testify. He goes, you may come at me with the sword of the spirit, but I come at you in the name of the Lord. And what he was saying was this. He delivered the lion and he delivered the bear into my hands. And he'll deliver you as well. Yes. What he, the word pagah in that moment literally means the same power that delivered that bear, which is bigger than the lion. Or about the same size, maybe. Uh, and the lion, that very same power, do it again. Yes. Do it again with the very same power, yes. the very same efficacy that you did then, do it again. Yes. Yes. That's what your testimony means. That's why you have to speak things. You gotta talk to it. Remember the blessing, the cheerfulness with the generous, that's connected, but guess what? Your words are connected to your testimony and God's power in your life. You want strong, you want courageous, start to testify what God did. God brought me out of this. God did this. I heard some crazy, funny stories yesterday. Like, look at God. Like, wow, that's like a movie. Like, I was picturing a door opening and somebody said, ah! <laughs> oh, hey, what's up? You know, like, I'd be freaking out. This person was cool as a cucumber. I'm like, dang, I need to increase my faith. Like, for real. Like, my faith needs to be increasing. Because I was like, last night, somebody knocked on our wall. I jumped up, I'm like, did you hear that? I was like, I'm like, where's my gun? And then I start checking through to make sure none of the kids have been abducted, because that's what I think in my head. You know, like. And then I go to Ava's room and she's like, Dad, wait! I go, did you hear it too? She goes, yeah, it's freaking me out. I go, cool. Let's pray. She goes, can you pray? I'm like, yeah. So we pray. She goes back to sleep, and I'm thinking, okay. <laughs> Who am I going to kill tonight? <laughs> Dragon in the house. You know, like I'm, I'm thinking this kind of stuff, right? I'm thinking these things. But I'm thinking <laughs> these things without fear. Because I know how God's delivered me out of things in the past. And I know that if he did it before, he'll do it again. So I could be strong and courageous at yeah. 2 in the morning or whatever time it was. 12 or something, just before I'm kind of messed up on my time. But what I'm trying to tell you is this. You've got to talk to some things. Yeah. You've got to speak to some things. This is going to be the year of the open door for you. You've got to talk to it. Yeah. Yeah. Depression, you have no place in my household. Yeah. Right. you got no place yeah. in my head. Yeah. you got no place in my life. Strongholds broken in Jesus' name. Spirit of depression broken off. Discouragement broken off. Lies, I don't listen to you no more. Talk to it. You gotta talk to it. You gotta talk to it. Now, here's the thing you can't talk what you wanna say to it. Like, I claim uh, the quad of my husband. No, you don't. Like, she's 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 taking her earrings over. Yourself healed, call yourself whole, 
Your house is your double joy. Double joy. We've already got a dose of it this morning. Amen. Would you pray with me?